Coming up on DTNS, a bad Linux bug that will make anyone a sandwich. Google kills, but open sources tilt brush for VR. And Molly Wood explains to us why GameStop stock is worth more than my car. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 27th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, as I mentioned, host of Marketplace Tech and my good friend, Molly Wood. Welcome back. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's been forever. What uh, a delight. It is. It's a delight to have you. We need you today to explain this whole GameStop <laughs> mess uh, to us. We were just talking with Molly a little bit about the GameStop stuff, um, also about the Go-Go's and Generation X. Uh, if you want that wider conversation, uh, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Intel launched its first Z gra desktop graphics cards offering three 4K display outputs with HDR support and supports decoding AV1 content. These cards will have four gigabytes of memory and 80 execution units. The cards were meant for pre-built systems paired with 9th gen Coffee Lake S and 10th gen Comic Lake S processors. So no, they won't work with AMD. They won't even work with all Intel processors. This is Intel's first de desktop graphics card since the Intel i740 series released way back in 1998. Apple's got a Q1 earnings report coming Wednesday, but research firms CounterPoint and Cyber Media Research estimate Apple shipped more than 1.5 million iPhone units in India in the quarter that ended in December, doubling the market share there to 4%. That would be Apple's best quarter in India to date. More sales of older generation iPhone 11, iPhone 10R, iPhone 12, and iPhone SE models helped move product, as did opening its own online India store, with plans for the first actual retail store in India coming later this year. Ring announced its smallest, cheapest video doorbell yet. The Ring video doorbell wired cost $59.99, which is $40 less than the Ring video doorbell that has a battery. It's available for pre-order shipping February 24th. And Amazon is also taking pre-orders for the Echo Show 10. That's the smart display that was announced back in September that has a swivel that automatically moves the display to face people and follow them around. Well, you know, it's still in one place, but it can follow you around. <laughs> it's got a bit of a range of motion. It's $250 shipping February 25th. Following reports of Iranian users having issues connecting to the messaging app Signal, the app's Twitter account claimed Iranian officials are now dropping all Signal traffic in the country. This comes after the app was removed from local app stores Cafe Bazaar and Mikeit on January 14th. OnePlus founder Carl Pei announced his next venture, a company called Nothing. Yes, not, not a Seinfeld reference is really the name of the company. Focused on making consumer smart devices with its first hardware expected to ship in the first half of 2021. Nothing will initially release hardware focused on simpler categories, hoping to differentiate its offerings by using custom-made components in its products at launch. All right, let's talk a little more about GameStop. GameStop stock started January at $18 a share, quite a bit up from the $3.30 a share it had been trading at in the summer. Uh, but it rose even more, 69% January 22nd, triggering a halt to its trading. Then Monday, this past Monday, January 25th, its trading was halted nine times. It reached $224 a share on Tuesday evening and was past $300 early Wednesday. Molly Wood, why is this happening? How did this start? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what I was afraid you were going to ask me. Yeah, I know. I Why know. is this happening? I was but just going to be this like, start? Yeah. you know, GameStop was always so fun because you'd go and then they would never take your game back at the price that you thought that they should take it at. Um, this is happening because uh, I guess the, the sort of shortest possible version uh, is that the internet has discovered the world's largest casino. And you have this sort of confluence of things happening, right? Trading is way more accessible in part because of Robinhood. You named an app Robinhood. What did you think was going to happen? Um, people remain super furious about things like the 2008 financial collapse and also shorting. And there's like no small amount of kind of Tesla fanboy rage that's playing into what were happening here. People were angry at all of this shorting of GameStop. Uh, that also left markets totally vulnerable to what we're seeing today. And they've suddenly figured out how to apply like crowdsourcing and actually what I've been calling Google bombing to 
the stock market. Like they're all buying. I mean, you know, the simplest answer here is they're all buying the same thing all at once. So you got are, thousands of they? people. Where are they coming from? I'm sorry. Yes, they're coming from primarily this Reddit board called Wall Street Bets, this subreddit. And it's existed for a long time. And it's a place to, you know, it's got like hardcore day traders in it. Some people who might have at some point been working for the same firms that are engaged in this activity right now. Um, retail investors, they're called, just individual humans buying into the stock market. And for whatever reason, this, again, this combination of events, maybe a little extra money, maybe more time on their hands about the pandemic, maybe just this kind of like pent up rage about inequality and this kind of edgelord troll sensibility that just said like, we can do this thing for the lulls. We can like ruin a hedge fund. Hey guys, if it turns out that GameStop is shorted at 140% of the outstanding shares, which means, you know, basically there's no way mathematically that it can go below zero. If we buy, hey guys, if we buy enough of this stock, then this hedge fund, and we all know that they're such dirtbags and they try to put Tesla out of business with shorting, there's no way they'll be able to cover their losses and they'll go out of business. Let's try it. So there are a lot of, yeah, like you said, retail traders, you know, everyday people who sort of say, let's stick it to the the big evil hedge funds. You know, all they care about is money and they're short selling and they're, you know, they're they they're in too much control. What is short selling exactly? Is it legal? Is it is it wrong? Short selling is super legal, yes. And I should I don't want to like overgeneralize the people on this subreddit, right? That is probably a lot of the people who were originally there. Some people are there going, geez, I lost my job in this pandemic and I need to buy food and this is a get rich quick scheme. Short selling is, in a nutshell, making a bet that the price of a stock is going to go down. And because you can bet on every single part of whatever happens anywhere in the entire universe, <laughs> like somebody's betting on, I don't know, quark creation in the universe right now. Um, <laughs> you can bet that the price of a stock is going to go down. And then you can put out a bunch of articles saying, here's why this stock is going to go down and help drive the price down, right? Like it's just a, it's kind of a dirty thing to do. And it has a long history of, of, of these activist investors saying this company is garbage and I'm going to do everything. My, I'm going to short it and then do everything in my power to make sure that my short bet comes true, that the price goes down. And if the, you know, you set your short purchase to expire on a certain day, right? So a bunch of these hedge funds have placed short bets on GameStop dating back months and months, like maybe Melvin Capital, actually, which is the hedge fund that sort of appears to have gone bankrupt today as a result of this movement with the GameStop stock, actually probably placed some of these short bets like 10 months ago. Okay, I think that this stock is going to be at $4. So... If the stock then, when that short sale is about to expire, is actually trading at $400, oh. Melvin has to buy all those stocks. I see. Or sell all those, sorry. Mel Melvin has to sell all the stocks it bought in GameStop at $4. So they can't just Even wait though, it out and be like, let's wait till Reddit moves on to something else and then buy the, the crappy stock again. They have to buy it because they've run they out of have time. To. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. And then what they do is they try to buy more as the price goes up to try to cover the difference. I am probably getting a lot of these details yeah. wrong, but this is like the general well, understanding. Yeah, the, if I understand Roger's it, like, uh, I'm sorry, I've been on the Wikipedia uh, page for a day and a half. Let me just <laughs> jump was, in here. Oh, no. Well, essentially what happens is when you buy, you buy a security, the value attached to that security doesn't matter. You, you own that one security. You own the number of shares. What happens is short sellers borrow for a fee. They pay a spot. They pay a fee to borrow those those shares, which means they have to return those shares eventually. Say they buy ten shares of something that they bo or they borrow ten shares of something. They can sell it for a hundred bucks a share right now on the expectation that it's going to go down to forty dollars in a month, right? And so all they have to do is to return back those ten shares. They only need to lay out four hundred dollars to buy ten. $40 shares instead of $1,000. So in effect, they made 600 bucks. But what Molly's saying is if the price of the share goes up, they still have to return those 10 shares back. Exactly. And if it goes from 100 to 1,000, now they got to spend $9,000 and that comes out of their account. Whether or not, again, the, the value doesn't matter. They need to return those shares back because they just borrowed them. Right. And they have to pay the difference. 
Yeah. So, so if the difference uh, is one point is thirteen billion dollars or whatever, which apparently I think with Melvin it was. Yeah, that's a lot then of Then they money, have to so. borrow that money from someone else to get it, or they have to buy shares at the inflated value, hoping that it won't go any higher than that. And then they got themselves even into more trouble because they borrowed or bought more, I think in this case, borrowed more shares, trying to short at what they thought the $110 is as high as it's possibly going to go. Nope. Well, and as it you, just as you, became this roll snowball. Sorry. As you put this, no, you're fine. As you as you, you put this, you call it a, a dirty old trick, a trick that's been going on for a long time. Does this move the needle at all in any sort of regulatory direction, or is it still just a dirty old trick that a bunch of internet trolls figured out how to exploit? I mean, I think it is just a dirty old trick that internet trolls figure out how to exploit. Like so far, all of it is legal. There are that we know of, right? There are certain rules around market manip manipulation, but I think that like organizing all your friends out in the open to all buy the same stock probably does not violate those rules. Short selling at least now doesn't violate any rules. And to be honest, if I, if, if I thought there was going to be a regulatory response to this, I I would imagine that it would protect the hedge funds and not the redditors. Like mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to make rules against short selling. If anything, if they if there is regulation that results from this, it will probably hurt individuals who want to buy into the stock market. And that's actually very bad. Like the the worst outcome here is that by showing how manipulatable this system is and by doing things that are perfectly acceptable behavior when they're done by hedge funds or even investment banks, it's possible that you would have regulators come in and go like, maybe we, maybe everybody who buys into the stock market has to be accredited. Or maybe if there's a certain amount of volatility and everybody's trying to buy the same stock at once, we just don't let them. And considering how few Americans are invested in the stock market anyway, that would be bad. I mean, Chamath Palahapitiya of Social Capital, he was on CNBC today having <laughs> this argument because CNBC is having like a meltdown over this because they're they're like the the church of the stock market is under attack by barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, really? Because it seems to me that you built the world's biggest casino and you shouldn't be surprised that gamblers showed up and that anything that you're going to do is just going to like further entrench poverty. It's going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, individuals. It's, it's, it's literally like the financial crisis writ large again, right? The people who got bailed out will get bailed out. The individuals will pay for it. So any rules to come in to try to stop this might cut in the wrong direction. Yeah, as, yeah. I, as I understand it, what's going on in Reddit isn't lying, right? So the, the usually what happens uh, with this sort of thing is somebody lies and says, oh, this company's gonna make a big comeback and, the, and it's not true. That's Reddit's not saying GameStop's gonna make a comeback. They're just saying, nope. let's all pile in and buy it and right. screw over these short sellers. So you would have to find another way to say they're doing something illegal and you'd have to figure out who to prosecute. There's not a particular ringleader, yeah. right? And so it's like, well, which one do you pick or do you go after them all? There's hundreds of thousands of them in there. Uh, the other thing is, I, I noticed, is the short sellers, sure, they've lost about $5 billion so far, but they're also placing new short selling bets because, hey, if I can borrow a bunch of stock and sell it at $300 a share, and I know this Reddit's going to get bored and mm -hmm. wander off, and that amount is going to plunge right back down, let's say to $18, not even $4, I'm going to make a lot of money. Because then yes. I can buy it at $18 and boom, you know, and I've got the, the difference hedge, between 300 and 18. 100%. And the hedge funds, to be clear, are all part of the same giant pool of money that just gets moved around from firm to firm to firm. And so there's this kind of whole other complicated part that Roger's probably already Wikipedia about um, how a lot of big firms have bought the basically the rights to early trading information on Robinhood. They can, they can essentially front run these trades. So like a firm called Citadel might realize that everybody's buying into GameStop, get on board with that, make a ton of money, and then loan that money to bail out Melvin Capital and then have that money be invested later and make money on it, right? So like at and the end two, of the day- there's two Citadels, by the way, if you're out there reading this, there's Citadel Securities, which has a deal with Robinhood, and then there's Citadel, which is doing what Molly's talking about. Um, and they're both going to benefit from this. And they're both, and they're both going to benefit. Exactly. Like at the end of the day, we shouldn't shed too many tears for what we think of the establishment investors, because all of those same investors are going to make money. Some retail investors on Reddit are going to make a lot of money. 
some retail investors on Reddit are going to be left holding the bag because right now there's a lot of pressure on them not to sell, even though the stock is really high and they could have made a lot of money. And so then now you're going to have this weird game theory thing to see who sells first, which will cause the price to go back down. And some individuals may lose an incredible amount of money. Yeah. It's a very I dangerous just, game. I don't want to get, t I mean, this is the, the whole thing is, is a dangerous game. It's twisted and crazy. I just can't believe it's all over a company I used to trade Madden 05 in for for 10 bucks. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Now they've, they've, they've turned to AMC Theaters, another yeah. one that's, you know, yeah. not probably going to go up anytime soon. BlackBerry is another one that's being targeted. So, yeah. Nokia, Blockbuster. It's a it's got a real nostalgia vibe to it. I feel like if you look at the the stocks they're choosing to inflate, you can really determine exactly how old they are. And it's basically um this room. I mean, is there any scenario where any of the companies that, you know, are sort of on that short sell list benefit at all from this? Well, they definitely benefit in the short term because they get a huge infusion of capital. Sure. Yeah. I mean, but if their it's... executives sell or their, their, you know, employees have any shares in the mm -hmm. equity in the company that they can sell, which, you know, I suppose a lot of these companies didn't do that. Um, the, the companies are in a weird position too, though, because right, it's like, it's not like they can go out and spend a ton of money if they think the stock price is then going to collapse again to $4 and they won't have access to that money. Um, but there could be some certainly benefit to at least the individual shareholders within the companies. Uh, Mike Akins, I, I put out an a, a editor's desk about this uh, to patrons. Uh, so if you're a patron at the $5 a month level and up, uh, you, you've already got that in your feed. Mike Akins responded that said, Note the behavior of unfettered short selling and the massive price movements you are seeing are prohibited in many other countries. This sort of option and short selling stock manipulation is illegal in the countries is illegal in the countries I have and do work in. And Mike's in Australia and works in other countries as well. So, um, so there are regulations you could put in place to put brakes on this sort of behavior, um, like Molly said. You may not and we're see that. we are starting to see some of that. Like TD yeah. America, I think was like, okay, no more trading in GameStop. But the thing about this sort of that's like, not a legal thing though. That's just TD Ameritrade saying that's like, just them being eh, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's in our best interest to not yeah. have that. Yeah, and the yeah. thing is, now it's a school of sharks, right? I know that sharks don't move in schools, but now you got this school of predatory fish. <laughs> that's, that's just, just how weird it is around the internet, being like, who's next? <laughs> so uh, sharks are going to school. Sharks are going to school. Title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Molly, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of a very busy schedule to, to help us understand this. If folks want to follow up on this and other stories, where should they go? Uh, please go to marketplace.org or makemesmart.org, where we're just going to be covering this until the end of time. And Marketplace Tech will have an episode about this exact thing with uh, Edward Ong. I forgot his name already, even though I talked to him this morning. Edward from Vice, who wrote okay. about this a couple days ago and just really had the like, seminal story on i've been on wall street bets for 10 years and this is what's going on now it's great, great. it's great thanks work. again molly bye thanks, molly microsoft reported revenue was up 70 percent last quarter and net income up 33 percent that is mostly due to growth from cloud surface and xbox uh, cloud's probably the least surprising. Office 365 commercial revenue grew 21%. Server products and cloud revenue grew 26%. Azure revenue grew 50%. And Microsoft 365 consumer subscribers grew 28% to 47.5 million. So going strong. Consumer demand for PCs grew a lot in 2020. So not surprising that Windows OEM non-pro revenue rose 24%. Uh, because that's the Windows that goes on consumer-level desktops. Overall, Windows revenue only rose 1%, but that's because enterprise-level Windows had already mostly upgraded from Windows 7, so they weren't expecting a lot of growth there. Uh, sales of Surface devices, 2% uh, up, the top $2 billion in the quarter. Not amazing, but growth. And I know you all want to hear about how the Xbox Series X and S did. Uh, in the first half quarter, uh, of their existence. They debuted November 10th. Xbox content and service revenue rose 40% on the year. Overall gaming revenue for Microsoft is up 51%, passing $5 billion in a quarter for the first time. Overall Xbox hardware up 86%. Mm. Uh, Game Pass subscribers rose 20% to 18 million subs. Satya Nadella said, quote, the launch of the Xbox Series X and Series S 
was the most successful in our history with the most devices ever sold in a launch month. But Microsoft never announces actual numbers. You just get that 86% increase. Also, Microsoft CFO Amy Hood said that the supplies will continue to be constrained. So even though they're selling a lot, there's a lot of demand, uh, that doesn't mean they magically are able to make more of them. Yeah, demand remains high for both them and Sony. But this is interesting because Microsoft's push into subscriptions uh, is the story here. Uh, the the rest of the year being a uh, rest, rest of 2020, that uh, that is being a pandemic year where people were like, well, we're not doing that $4,000 vacation. We may as well spend a chunk of money on our home entertainment. And some of that is gaming. That is absolutely a factor in their growth. And I'm sure other numbers we're going to hear from others. But a big part of this is that coincided with them also doing what they had always planned to do ahead of the Series X launch and S was to push game uh, Game Pass Ultimate and regular Game Pass and PC Game Pass uh, really hard and really fast and try to get people unified on that platform to be ready for these new consoles. And I think that worked. And in some ways, they got really lucky. You hate to say there's any luck during a pandemic, but from a financial perspective, they were lucky to be in the position that they were in, making the moves they were making that year, and also have that year be a year where a lot of people are stuck at home and a lot of people are spending money on stuff like Xboxes and games for it. So this is huge for them. These are really, really good numbers. Um, I do wish they gave us actual numbers and not percentage growth. That would be cool because I just love to hear it. But uh, it, those are great numbers and what Sony uh, will present whenever they talk about theirs and what success they had or didn't have with the PS5 will be interesting because they are also heavily constrained in terms of uh, production to meet demand. But um, yeah, like out of the gate for a new console launch, I don't know if you could ask for more if I were them. Well, and especially with you know a constrained supply chain and really good numbers like this, the numbers may spill over into the next quarter more than they might have otherwise. I mean, sure, you could have had more of a blowout quarter, but good numbers two quarters in a row is often better, you yeah. know, because it's it's more it's sustained growth. They also, I think carried through and like succeeded on the promise that was game pass <clears throat> and by that i mean they provided for what is relatively a low price the price of 15 bucks a month which is you know a good netflix subscription or if you play world of warcraft it's one game you're paying for and they gave that to people with hundreds literally hundreds of games threw in ea play on top of it which is ea's games all available to play all under the same roof for a very low price suddenly it suddenly the, the world changed for people who were like, well, wait, I don't want to spend 70 bucks a pop every couple of months or every month on a new game. Instead, you pay this low fee and you get access to everything. And I think they just, I think they succeeded on that sale and it happened in a year where that sale made a ton of sense. So yeah, I guess good on them. We'll see if they can maintain. Hey folks, uh, if you want to talk about this or uh, I don't know, studies show that viewers like things with XX in the name. Uh, that's actually something Jerry Heiselman just said in our Discord. And you can join and talk to him about it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. A bug in the Linux utility pseudo called Baron Sametit was patched after being discovered by the security researchers at Qualys two weeks ago. The bugs would allow attackers that gained access to a low-privileged account to then elevate them to root access. The bug impacts almost all pseudo installs and was introduced into the app's code in July of 2011. This is uh, both the worst uh, security story of the day and not as bad as maybe you think, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, sudo elevates you to root access. So it's bad because anybody that gets into your Linux system can get root access. And one of the things that you are recommended to do is not run in root all the time. That way, if somebody does compromise your user account, they can't take over the machine because they don't have your root account. Uh, so this gets rid of that. They still have to crack into one of your user accounts to do this. This doesn't just magically give them easy access. Uh, it just makes it easier to get to the full machine control, which is bad. I'm not trying to downplay that. On the other hand, so many Windows and Mac OS users run as root anyway uh, that it's sort of bringing Linux down to the level of what a lot of people do on Windows and, and Mac OS. So it could be worse is what I'm saying. Uh, I it, The problem is this is going to happen to somebody who knows better, whereas with Windows and Mac OS, often it's not. Uh, 
Uh, but it's it's not the end of the world. It's a really bad bug, and you should patch it right away, though. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because the Linux folks they really pride themselves on their security. Like security is a built-in part of the ecosystem of why everyone loves Linux and can't wait to run their servers on and whatever. Uh, so yeah, this seems worse because of that, I think, or in light of that, whereas your average windows or Mac users, like what does root even mean? Like, yeah, they don't even know what you're talking about. So if you're, yeah, if you're are... kind of like fuzzy on sudo, uh, like you basically say, uh, I want to do this thing. And the operating system says, you can't do that thing. You don't have root access. And you're like, well, I don't want to have to log out and log back in. So sudo, let me give you my root credentials and then do that thing and then go away. And so the configuration file that goes with that is what's at heart at the heart of this vulnerability. Uh, the most famous explanation of sudo is the XKCD comma, uh, make me a sandwich, do it yourself. Sudo, make me a sandwich. Okay, I guess I'll go <laughs> make it. <Right. laughs> perfect, perfect reference. Uh, Google announced it has ended active development of its VR painting app, Tilt Brush. Now, don't get too excited yet, you guys. There's details here. For once, they didn't kill it. They open sourced it which I wish they'd do more often. Anyway, Tilt Brush gives users virtual art tools like brushes to make art, including sculptures and virtual reality. There's a lot of uh, uh, particle uh, effects and all sorts of stuff. You can create fire in that world. It's very cool. Source code is published on GitHub for developers to build on the app, and they will continue to be, make it available on the VR app stores. Tilt Brush co-creator Patrick Hackett left Google earlier this month to join the I, uh, Illusions VR game studio, Hackard, or Hackett rather, tweeted on Tuesday, quote, to some, this may look like the end of Tilt Brush. To me, this is immortality, unquote. <laughs> I'm uh, really glad that Tilt Brush is not going away. Uh, Scott, you are the artist of the group here. I, I have no talent, but I liked Tilt Brush a lot. I think it was something that was in the Oculus store, because I have the original Oculus Quest. It was like, oh, this is one of the, you know, the... The, you know, games of the year or something like that. And so I downloaded it because I uh, just, I don't know, wanted to check out a bunch of different VR games. I was getting into it. I was like, oh, this is so fun. I'm not really, I don't really have a goal. This isn't really anything I'm necessarily going to share with anybody. I could if I wanted to. But it was just a fun kind of meditative, creative little VR experience. And I've I've gone back in multiple times just to play around a little bit. So it feels like going open source gives it, more life than it even had before, potentially more life, because you got other creative people saying, you know what I always wanted it to have? Let's mm. add that. Let's yeah. add that version. It's entirely possible that it gets new life from this. Um, on the other hand, it could gain some obscurity because it's not a mainline Google-produced product. Probably their name wouldn't be on it anymore. Who knows? But but I, I do think probably it's got a long life ahead of it. It was a really cool thing. And even if your goal was just to be inspired, you could go in there and pull up community creations that others have done. And then walk around in the stuff they made, add to it, remove from it, like mess around in whatever they created. And some people were beyond crazy how cool the stuff they were making. So it was really, really, I think, a very special experience. And two of my most memorable experiences on VR so far have been messing about with Tilt Brush and what possibilities lied therein. And the Google Maps integration that basically gave you Google Earth to walk around in so you could walk around in your really low res ugly neighborhood but it was still this cool idea of what you could do and for whatever reason every time google tries something in vr it's really awesome but it's usually like a just a fun one-off or a goofy idea they had and tilt brush is certainly not a profit center for google or anything they plan to do much more with so i guess in this case i'm a little sad that they don't see the value in continuing to be you know to flagship it but on the other hand they didn't put it in the ground like most of the stuff they cancel. That's a step up, in my opinion. So, Tilt Brush, you have a future, we hope. <laughs> we hope. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we get a lot of emails, but we get a lot of questions and comments and great ideas in lots of places. Discord is one of those places, and this one comes from Doctor, who says, listening to the January 26 Rewind bonus show, that's where we go back five years and talk about what was happening right about now, back then. Doctor says... Thinking about Elon Musk at the time, talking about using Summon across the country, assuming that charging was available across the country, could be accessed by an unattended car. And laws allowed for such and had provisions for if an accident occurred with an unattended vehicle. Wouldn't it be faster, though, to just get the car shipped cross-country? Maybe cheaper. 
with all that charging. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? I guess it would be faster because they wouldn't have to stop as much and maybe cheaper if they had to be if they had to pay for the charging. But, you know, sometimes Tesla users can get bargains. But yeah, I I, I told doctor at the Discord, I was like, you just get an electric uh, auto, autonomous truck. To yeah. Take your car for you. <laughs> right. Festival or even yes. even those big, you know, triple stacked car, uh, trucks that bring cars to dealerships from around the country and that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Like just yeah. pay to have your car transported. I love That's that. It's like my car needs to go cross country. I will not be in that car. <laughs> It's too expensive for my car to drive itself, even though it can. So I want an electric big truck to put my car on with other cars like mine. Right. Split <laughs> the cost with a bunch of other people. It all makes with sense. It's just, yeah, yeah it's an interesting. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of layers there. Hey, if you've got feedback for us, feedback at Daily Tech News Show is a great place to send it. Thank you in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today, they include Chris Benito, John and Becky Johnston, and Gadget Virtuoso. Thank you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. We learned a lot about stocks. We talked about art, talked about Microsoft and everything in between. Where can people keep up with the rest of your work? Well, there's a lot going on. Um, I know that people tune into this show partly because they get daily access to great tech headlines and commentary and synopsis. And so if you're like, man, I really like daily content, I make a morning show and have for 10 years now. We hit our 10-year 10 10 year anniversary this last weekend and still going strong, having a great time with it. It's a little more light and fun, but Tom comes on Wednesdays and talks about what's happening in tech. So you'll even get a piece of that every Wednesday. Anyway, go check it out. It's at uh, the morning stream. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find it over at frogpants.com slash TMS. Everything else is also there, and you can always follow me on Twitter. I'm at uh, twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. Hey, we have great patron rewards. One of them is that every uh, week I do an editor's desk. Uh, sometimes it's about how we do the show. Sometimes it's about my thoughts on stories. And today, as I mentioned earlier, it's about this GameStop stock situation. So if you want me, hear me take some time to explain short selling, call options, how this is all fitting together. It's a longer version uh, of what you would get in Daily Tech News Show. Uh, you have to be at the $5 level a month or above, and you go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Folks, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Put it on your calendar. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>